And um, is, uh, it is mid-August. It is a time when you are now seeing all of the lines that once shielded us from the reality we live in sort of breaking down. And the world around us is uh, nearly unrecognizable from what it was two years ago. And in a lot of ways, this is what, of course, we've been talking about with the Eye of the Needle series. Is this distortion field, this... Um, hyper-energized system that we have to go through, hopefully to get to the other side as a much wiser civilization on this world. And um, part of that wisdom is, of course, knowledge of the past, studying it, understanding it, and also learning from it so that we don't wind up in the same place again. Um, to that end tonight, my guest is uh, coming to us from a place of uh, pretty deep insight into history and historical writings, historical books, and um, let's just say things that are a little off of the paved highway of information. He has spent uh, several decades excavating the uh, deep information that has been pushed aside by most historicists, certainly in the fields of religion and mysticism. And uh, I want to welcome back f for this show, Joseph Lumpkin. Hello, Randy. Welcome back. But let's go through it. You're the CEO of Fifth Estate Publishing, uh, which has a huge catalog that includes the books of Venoc, uh, the Book of Giants, Lost Book of the Bibles, Lost and Rejected Scriptures. So many paths that you've gone down over the years, Joseph. You, he also, Joseph also has a background as well. He worked in research and development within the U.S., Department of Defense on major projects, including hypersonic missile technology and supercomputer clustering. Perfect. These are skills that, uh, wow, they just weigh into the landscape heavily now. Joseph, welcome back. It's good to talk to you again. It's been way too long, my friend. Oh, it has been. I, I really uh, cherish our time, Randy. The last time we got together, we uh, wandered far and wide, but I, I really enjoyed it. It's the wandering that's good. We always start out with a premise somewhere, and uh, where we go is it's um, it's a journey of two guys that get the chance to sit down and share ideas. And there's <clears throat> certainly a lot of ideas floating around right now. You've been busy um, with uh, publishing and um, the books that you're producing on a on a regular basis. Uh, for those who don't know, the website is Fifth Estate Pub. Dot com, and there will be information in links and all kinds of good things that you can click on in the show notes that go out with this wherever you find it. They'll be probably in the little box below the podcast. As well, there will be a page with previous shows with Joseph uh, on offplanetradio.com, which is the new website. This is this is ground zero starting over on a website, by the way, the old .net websites. Uh, fell prey to bot, bot attacks and databases were compromised, so basically lost those sites. Hopefully get, get them back at some point. But I decided to rebuild the platform um, on a more modern platform, not being WordPress anymore because WordPress was heavily compromised. So I'm driving traffic towards that. So offplanetradio.com, you can find this show, other shows, and links to wherever else you can find us. Um, Joseph, tell us what's new, what's going on. We're gonna, by the way, we're gonna talk tonight. I know I'm all over the map. I'm rusty. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a rusty show host. I've been sidelined for almost a month and a half as a result of. Um, the infirmity that has um, plagued our world. Uh, but um, one of the things that we're going to begin with subject matter tonight is going to be a look at the law of attraction and manifesting will and divine right, uh, subjects that 
you know, I don't think I've had this kind of treatment before and very historical as well. So uh, that is that is what's new in the catalog. Um, we we I, I guess Randy just got too big for me. So um, I asked my son, who's got a, a degree in uh, psychology and uh, uh, economics to uh, come join me at Fifth Estate. Mm hmm. And he was having some problems ethically. Uh, he was working in the banking industry, and he had called me up and said, "Dad, I just, I just don't feel like I can do this ethically anymore. It's just getting so, so gray." And I said, "Well, I really need the help here." So, uh, so he came on, on board, and uh, Brendan and I have put out our first book together, which is the, uh, the four books of uh, Florence Shin, and. Uh, uh, you kind of wonder why a, a theologian would would look at this, but um, the work of Florence Shin informed the uh, the prosperity gospels of today. Uh, it, it literally is a a clear uh, clarion line that you can draw between uh, the the New Thought movement of the late eighteen and early nineteen hundreds into the uh, power of positive thinking and Napoleon Hill, mm -hmm. and then into the teachings of the prosperity gospel, or what some people would call Word name faith. it and claim it theology. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. And the, um, that's right, yeah. that's right. The Sunday but morning oddly enough, uh, oddly enough, this uh, she began uh, with, with kind of an amalgam of a lot of different Eastern religions, uh, you know, being informed by Buddhism and Hinduism. And uh, in her books, she, of course, quotes a lot of scripture. It's interesting that she doesn't bother telling you where any of the scriptures came from. She just blurts out a line or two. Yeah. You know? uh, for uh, Just to, to fill in the background a little bit, maybe you can give us a little thumbnail sketch of Florence Shin and who she was and when she was. and. Well, um, you know, everybody thinks she kind of came out of nowhere, but but honestly, she was from a very prominent family. Yes, her I looked at her background. This is a daughter of the American Revolution, quite frankly. Uh, definitely. Her father, or I think actually her grandfather, signed the Declaration of yes. Independence. And uh, so, it, and that kind of just kind of startled me. So she was uh, from a well-known family, and she was well-heeled, as they say. Uh, she was born uh, in 1871, I believe it was, in New Jersey. She ended up dying in the 1940s, and uh, in, I think it was October of 1940, she passed away. She had written three major texts, and she was actually finishing her fourth when she passed away. And the fourth text was, you know, kind of a, a opus, you know, a, and after she died, a couple of years later, one of her students picked it up and polished it off, finished it, and published it. So uh, we now have four of the books of Florence Shen, and she was uh, one of the major contributors of what we now call the New Thought Movement. And that New Thought Movement basically said that invisible forces are ever working for man who is always pulling the strings by himself although he does not know it. And she mm -hmm. set about to teach wow. us how to recognize and pull these strings, not arbitrarily and not subconsciously, but to bring it into consciousness and make it work for us. Yeah, and in this book, um, you obviously have excerpted a uh, good part of, I guess, the game of life and how to play it. We see her kind of go into being a practitioner where she's got people that are coming to her and, I mean, there's real world solutions that are manifesting as she's, as she's writing about this. You would almost think, reading this book, that she was a faith healer who was mm -hmm. very consistent, very consistent. But she's not healing the body, she's healing the soul, the spirit and therefore the body follows. Uh, but she's also healing uh, what I would call uh, life problems, uh, problems that, that we set for ourselves. You know, my, my feeling of theology, my, my take on theology is pretty simplistic. 
um, we blame a lot of things on God and Satan that we do ourselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we, we will blame it on something outside of ourselves when, you know, 99% of the problem is always the way that we are approaching life or thinking about life. She hits this thing head on. Uh, and, and she really does a good job at pointing out uh, what we do to ourselves, how we think, how we approach life, and, and what kind of minefield we actually sow into our own life and how to get rid of it. The whole textual blend there of the concept that both were, you know, were, were empowered by something that dwells within us. And it's very consistent. I mean, you know, I was part of the word faith, um, actually was ordained in a word faith church, church that was um, birthed under Kenneth Hagin. So I'm real familiar with the application of this in terms of uh, what is called word faith or name it and claim it, which is somewhat of a a glib way of summarizing it. It really was... um, what they called the conf- positive confessions. And those positive confessions were powerful when they were applied. The problem was that it was saturated in a culture of uh, materialism, and um, including doctrinally enforced tithing, which I found myself yes. becoming very opposed to as I went through this. It was one of the reasons why I left the church, because it was a bondage to people who both couldn't probably afford to tithe and probably didn't have it in their hearts to do so properly, which is a lot of the problem with all of this. It's the application of faith. Yes, it, it truly is. You, you, can't, um, you can't force yourself to do something and, uh, and expect good outcome. Uh, you, you, are, you are basically sowing it in uh, in discord and it's going to come out somehow yeah uh, i personally think that uh, tithing is a is an old testament thing uh and, and should not have ever been brought into the new testament except to give as your heart uh you know leads you uh but we um you know i, I know we're going to digress i know we're going to kind of wander but let me just throw this at, yeah. out there to you so if you look at the highest point of any religion uh, that is to say, the, uh, the, the ultimate attainment of any religion, it tells you a lot about that religion. In the Western religions and Christianity, we have a, a, a heaven that is uh, streets of gold and gates of pearl. And, um, and you, you look at that, and if you do that from a kind of a vantage point of non-attachment, you go, wow, that's rather materialistic. And if you look at the, uh, the heaven of uh, the Quran, you see 72 virgins that are perpetually virgin and uh, they're, they're having sex all the time. And, <laughs> and you think to yourself, wow, that, that's, that's pretty cardinal and it really is misogynistic and it's a, a horrible way of um, thinking about women as kind of enslaved to men. And take a step back from these religions and look at their heavens and you will see the, the fingerprints in a, in, a, in a thumbnail sketch, pardon the pun, of how these religions interact with their followers. So you, you, you have everything in the heaven of a religion condensed down into the faithful, and, and, and you see the problems in the religion by, uh, by looking at the ultimate attainment. So, you know, you, you can look at the heaven, analyze it, and then go home because you figured it out. You, you figured out what the final outcome of the religion is going to be. Yeah. And in the, in the process of doing that removes what I consider to be the beauty of the mystery of what right. it is. And even the words of Jesus, which said that the, the kingdom of God is within you, which, you know, park that statement in front of so much else that's in the text itself and you suddenly realize that that it boils down to some things that are really simple there were really really only two laws and they were both laws of love love other people the way you love yourself and as you love god and when the kingdom's within you this 
process becomes an internal process. This is a lot of what I talk about in my Eye of the Needle material, is the inner process of this journey that we're on and the fact that um, we've, we've, we've externalized everything and we yes. have yes. lost the connection to the center of this which truly is internal. It's an internal process. And right, right. The religion that we are calling Christianity today is not Jesus' religion. No, That's not the problem. No. Uh, now, and, and, and of course, that brings us to one of the favorite subjects that you and I have trampled about, <laughs> which is the a actual a axial age, which yeah. basically says that there was this great awakening around uh, 800 B.C. to about 100 A.D., where the entire world became uh, or was given a choice, I, I guess it could be said, from having an external religion of trying to please God through sacrifice and rituals and all of these things to an internal religion of uh, and a journey more than a religion. Uh, and, and so Lao Tzu was born and Confucius and Zoroaster and Buddha and Jesus, all within this one little period of about 900 years, the entire world woke up at one time at a blink of an eye and changed only some of us were left behind mm -hmm. and if you look at the wars on the world today the war of the of uh, taking taking uh, Russia out of the equation and saying to yourself what what are the wars going on? and what you have is the internal religions uh, versus the external religions or Maybe a better way of putting it is that the external religions are at war with the world, because that's what they do. Uh, everything has to be uh, has to be forced. Uh, you have to be forced into the rules, forced into the regulations, forced into the rituals, forced into the dogma, and um, and so the people, for example, in Afghanistan, we left them in a good position. What happened? Those people who uh, want to enslave them into these rituals came back and took control. <laughs> sort of reminds me of that famous verse about um, casting out devils and how if you let them come back in, they'll come back manifold. And oh, yeah. Absolutely. In a lot of ways, it's unfavorable to say that our excursions into the Middle East have been part of, you know, both a, a jihad on the era, we would say, Islamic side of it, and then this holy war, because most of this has been carried out under the edicts and platforms of what I'll just call the evangelical ultra-right, which believes that they have the um, divine right to wage war in God's name. And that's so, yeah. So God is uh, on everyone's side in a war. God's on both sides, isn't he? Everybody thinks that God's on their side. And fundamentalism in any religion is is yes. just toxic, absolutely toxic. So, um, but religion evolves. Religion is not stagnant, and uh, and it's very interesting to see the journey. Um, for example, if you look at uh, the work of this new thought movement with Florence Shin, uh, you see the beginnings of Mary Baker Eddy mm -hmm. and uh, Christian Science. Christian Science, that's right. And the Unity Church, they mm -hmm. both came out of this movement. Um, and, you know, the thing about Christian Science is it, it has a, a pretty balanced concept of God in that they open their prayer with Mother, Father, God. Yes. And uh, so you, you have at least that balance of... Uh, of the positive and negative uh, or yin and yang energies, which have been stomped out of most religions. Most religions do not uh, acknowledge a feminine, feminine power. Exactly, which, you know, that was one of our early uh, shows that we did together was on the sacred feminine. And yes. um, going back into my days on threshing floor towards, you know, probably the last few years of that, I did a show called The Person of the Holy Spirit where you know, from my standpoint, I showed you, and just inside the writ of the King James Bible, that there was this person called Wisdom, which looked an awful lot to me 
like the Holy Spirit, and that this, there was a balancing energetic that was occurring and thing, understanding that the, well, I believe that the Godhead, however you view that, is above, you know, the, the human expressions. I believe it expresses in many ways, and one of them most certainly has to be feminine. I mean, uh, You're so absolutely I, right. I see the person of the Holy Spirit as a feminine spirit, not necessarily as a female as we understand it, because a lot of what we've done is anthropomorphize all of these deities, and in the process we've given them, we've really kind of imbued them with our own particular pathos, so to speak. Oh, and that is the thing that has so constrained us. Uh, it is pretty obvious to see that Ruach, uh, the, the spirit of God, brooded over the water mm -hmm. as, uh, as, a, as a female would uh, her, uh, her offspring and, and brought forth life. Uh, uh, wisdom is Sophia, and Sophia is as feminine as you can get. Uh, it's, um, it's there. Uh, John, the, the letters of John, he, he addresses uh, the, uh, the lady and her, her children. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, and we're taught, well, that's the church, but that's not what the text says. The text calls her electa. The elected lady. Yes, it's translated uh, from a word that is actually a name of a woman. So, Electa, and and her uh, her church. So, uh, it's a great uh, argument uh, that uh, that Christianity in the first century was being driven partially, if not uh, over fifty percent, by contributions in time and money of women. And uh, and so here we go through the years trying to stomp that out. Yeah, the um, it's interesting to look at this new thought movement and see that woven into it are uh, of females that were part of the birthing of these movements, and including Mary Baker Eddy, um, oh yes, Charles yeah. and Myrtle Fillmore. Um, were part yeah, of this Emma, and, and Florence Emma uh, Curtis Hopkins yes yeah. absolutely yeah and so even there there was this kind of <clears throat> equalization that was taking place of that women could be I guess what we call in the modern parlance ministers of the gospel or just ministers so minister means to serve that's yeah the meaning yes. of the word yes, yeah so the word deaconess occurs uh, in the scriptures a couple of times, and of course that's uh, that, that's reinterpreted. I know how it's reinterpreted. I heard it directly from the lips of a pastor in a church. Yes, I know how that was interpreted. So it, it really, uh, but so if you look at the um, the path that the new thought movement uh, came into being. It actually started with the discovery from these mesmerists and hypnotists that, when there was a brand new thing at the time, that they were discovering what effect the mind had over the body and the mind had over the approach in life. And, uh, and they were looking at this and at the same time, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out why all religions seem to work and let me let me stop right here because you know there's going to be a lot of people that go well wait a minute what look no matter what religion what major religion you are the the followers of that religion will tell you that their prayer works mm -hmm. their faith works so if the prayer and the faith of all believers in whatever deity work, then you must consider at least taking the, the construct within the religion and removing the religiosity from it and asking yourself, what is the mechanism that underpins all of these religions who claim that their mindset, their meditation, their prayer works? And it turns out that it is intent. And it is intent and the affirmation 
uh, that that uh, comes, uh, let's say, through or beyond the conscious into the subconscious that starts enabling the universe to work through you. Yeah, and this, I mean, look, you know, in the modern world, this is understood in, in sort of a different framework from psychology. When we, you know, especially if you look at um, Carl Jung's work, the archetypal aspects of, uh, of psychology and how that is basically the activation of an internal process. I mean, the hero's journey is exactly that. It's simply an allegory for this journey that we go on, which we are put through trials and conflicts and then through the power of our minds, through our spirits, we're able to come out of the other end of that victorious and much wiser, hopefully. Absolutely. So in, in our... Uh in our world today, we, we think probably that this is uh, just so obvious. But I want you to keep in mind what was going on at the time. Uh, the, the Christian world was, was just kind of, it was shaking. Uh, the foundations were shaking. Uh, in this same period of time, the Azusa Street movement was happening in mm -hmm, California. Mm -hmm. The beginning and of Pentecostalism. Yeah. Yes, yes. So you had, you had these Pentecostals that that were actually uh, Wesleyans. They were Methodists, and, mm -hmm. and you know, and and they were. And like, keep in mind that Methodists, the word Methodist is actually derogatory because it, it it said you approach this religion of Christianity in such a method that you you are step by step, logical, reasonable. Everything happens to happen. It's three three songs and a prayer. Uh, everything mm -hmm. is always the same. I know. It's I like was raised Methodist. <laughs> <laughs> so my wife was Methodist and I was Baptist, and then I went into the Pentecostal movement just like you did. Yeah. And and so you have these kind of cold, uh, you know, uh, step by step, and then all of a sudden something exploded, and you had the charisma, you had the uh, the outflowing of the Holy Spirit. So the the world of Christianity was literally changing. And they were trying to shake off the religion and get to a personal experience of God. And that was coming out in fits of ecstasy, uh, signs and wonders, uh, tongues interpretation, all of these things. That's happening on that part of the religion, the world of religion, at the same time that the New Thought movement is trying to do the same thing. Uh, in their own way. And, and so, I, you know, I believe that there are times and seasons within the world where uh, a thought uh, process gets started and it literally goes worldwide. You know, uh, patents on the telephone, for example, mm -hmm. uh, put up by two or three people at the same time. This, these things happen over and over. So now you have, and I'm going to shut up in a minute, but now you have the idea of the Dhammapada from Buddha being brought in where it says, uh, well, let's see, this, this quote by uh, Bhikkhu uh, really kind of sums it up. He says, he's, he's translating it, the phenomena are preceded by the heart, ruled by the heart, made of the heart. And if you speak or act with a corrupt heart, suffering follows you like a, like a wheel of a cart, the track of the ox that pulls it. Phenomena is preceded by the heart, ruled by the heart, made of the heart, and if you speak or act with a calm, bright heart, then happiness follows you like a shadow that never leaves you. So these are, wow. these are powerful words, powerful words that, that drill down into the heart of the new thought movement. If, if, if this is true, then we can manifest a better life a happier life, uh, mm -hmm. a more fulfilled life. And we can allow the universe to work through us. And so whether it be the new thought movement or the, uh, the charismatic movement that's happening in Azusa street, it is the same seed being planted by the universe and we are evolving spiritually. 
And again, it goes back into that concept of this second axial age, that there's a procession of events that have been building upon each other over a long period of time. And then they come to a fulcrum and they kind of quicken. And I, I, I watch this from a different standpoint. Oddly enough, as a result of the show and being involved with what I come to call kind of the flaky new age movement that grew up in the um, 2000s on the internet. And we began to see um, a movement there, some of it quite legitimate in terms of uh, a book called The Secret, which was yes. the new age version of exactly what we're talking about with, with even Florence Shin. But it got crazy because, again, like what happened inside of these prosperity churches is it got ultra-materialistic, and a lot of people just lost their bearings in the whole thing. After 2012, there were, there were literally, I'd say, a dozen movements on the Internet, major movements, thousands of people that were claiming that uh, there was going to be a, a new currency system and a forgiveness of debts, a sort of jubilee type thing. And uh, it, with that came a whole lot of financial, uh, we'll say, irresponsibility as a result of it. And it basically it blew itself out as what it was. Mm -hmm. But there was a legitimacy yeah. behind it. There was a legitimacy behind the concepts of the secret. There's a legitimacy to manifestation. You know, you have, uh, well, Abraham Hicks, um, Esther Hicks, who channels the Abrahams, and they've talked about this, I think, for 30 years now. And, she, you know, obviously, uh, you go to an Esther Hicks meeting, there are people there who find something they didn't know they were even looking for as a result of an encounter with something they don't completely understand. It's almost like this unconscious off-world intelligence that they're interacting with, which, as I've studied this over the years and come to understand it and even understand um, my own encounters with the supernatural, we are encountering something that is an aspect of ourselves, that is a power, it's a spirit, it's something that externalizes, but the cause itself is not necessarily external. But I think where religion and prayer came into it was the ability to sort of utilize the concept of God or creator as a way to activate within ourselves. And I think that's actually really what all the great figures, the, the Buddhas, the Krishnas, the uh, uh, writers of uh, the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu, all of these writers were pointing to something that was internal. But man yes. being man needed that externalization in order to activate it. So when you <clears throat> Pardon me. When you put this uh, in too much of a tight religious context, mm -hmm. it, uh, you you end up with some real problems. You you end up uh, looking. It, it looks as if God is being a puppet and you're pulling his strings. The uh, that's one of the problems in the uh, Hagen uh, uh, Copeland uh, Caps kind of approach to this is. Uh, you know, they'll tell you if you have enough faith, God is um, is he, he is bound and 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 uh, uh, promised to do this, and so you end up with a, a God that's actually a puppet. Uh, when that's not exactly that's not what's happening at all. Uh, uh, I number one, you have to de-anthropomorphize, as you say, and and get rid of the concept that God is a person. Um, it, it's better to look at this as an, an energy uh, of creativity and love. And uh, the other thing is you have to approach it like Jesus approached it, which is I don't do anything until I see it done in heaven. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the whole secret. If, if you can get to that point, then you have basically mastered what 
uh, Florence Scovel Shin is trying to teach. Uh, set up a mindset where you are not trying to tell the universe how to accomplish what you are asking, uh, what you're asking it to accomplish, but you you have a goal and aim, and you say to the universe uh, and to yourself. I'm going to allow this to work out, and I'm not going to have any preconceived ideas. Here's, here's the trick, though. If you don't do it like that, then if I want that Cadillac or that, uh, that Bentley, and you want that Bentley, uh, then we've got a, a faith tug of war going on. But if you get away from the idea that uh, it's a zero-sum game, and the universe is going to work out whatever the universe is going to work out. When that happens, you no, lo, no longer have a zero-sum game, and things will work out the way that they should. Uh, you may not get the black Cadillac. You might get the white one, and you might like it better. And you may not have wanted or needed the Cadillac in the first place. Maybe in this case you uh, – required something a little more modest because there was something else in the background that was actually, I guess, subconsciously what we call unfulfilled needs, which is a lot of what I see even in my own inner work. You know, I've, my listeners know this. I, I've gone through health difficulties and I found myself at a place where I've confronted this and I wanted healed, damn it. And... Yes. What happened instead was it wasn't the symptoms themselves which were a manifestation. It was something inside of me that needed to be addressed. And, you know, I won't go into a great detail except to say that I had to begin a journey of inner healing in order to effectuate an outer healing of, the, of my body. And in a lot of cases, what people pray for, and Jesus addresses this in the New Testament, you know, to pray rightfully, to understand yes. you're addressing your heart to Creator, thus the activation. But, you know, what if you didn't need the Bentley or the Cadillac? Maybe what you really needed was a, a roof over your head or, you know, the, you the money to do something worthwhile. Yes. So um, you're absolutely right. I totally agree with everything that you said. And, uh, you know, forgive me for, for venturing into No, go where you want to go. It, I love it. it well, yeah, it, it's just a, a quick and easy way of expressing. But here's what New Thought holds, which is exactly what you're talking about. God is infinitely intelligent and everywhere. Mm -hmm. The Spirit is totally real true uh, human selfhood is divine. Divine thought is a force for good. Most sickness originates in the mind, and right healing has, or right thinking has a healing effect. So, if you take those things kind of unconditionally, and you believe that, uh, that, that God is real, uh, that there is love and good in the universe, that divine thought, that the thought and, and force from God is, is for good and for love. Uh, and you align with that, uh, then, then you begin to manifest the things that actually uh, are, are needed. Um, our mental states are carried forward into a manifestation and, uh, and in time, it becomes a daily experience. And that's what Shin was trying to, to, to get us to do. Um, divinity dwells within each person. In that divinity, uh, you know, love and do what you will. But it has to be agape. It cannot be anything else but agape. Mm -hmm. Which very few people understand what agape is, or even love itself. Because it has been, the word itself has been... How do I even describe it? I mean, the modern definition of love is fleeting. It's defined by relationships that are tenuous at best with people whose commitments sometimes are less than honorable. And 
in this world, uh, I think what we're seeing right now is even a refre reflection of our lack of understanding of agape. Uh, just having gone through the last two and a half years, the illness, the, the malady around us, among us, whatever its causation, whatever you want to call it, whatever divisive issues you want to bring into the whole concept, was demonstrating, again, the same thing. The sickness in the body indicates a malady of the spirit and the soul, and that as a race of people on this world, what we're really being asked to look at and deal with is the internal process collectively and individually. And this is what you're seeing work out. You, you wrote something to me today, and I'm going to read this because it struck me. Um, basically goes into uh, the idea of how memes that proclaim the order cannot come from chaos show a lack of understanding of chaos. Since given time, chaos produces temporary order. So we are chaos falling through time, coming into an order for a time temporarily. Everything expands, including molecules. And when I saw the word chaos, it grabbed my eye and I, it kind of encapsulates the way I see where we're at right now as a collective in humanity and individually, I think, all of us, because we've all been impacted in some way, shape, or form by what's going on. So, yes, um, I, I see all of these uh, very religious people who who say, you know, how can how can order come out of chaos? Well, they they truly do not understand the mathematics behind chaos theory, um, which is that you have an infinite rolling of the dice, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And in time, you will come up with, uh, you know, six dice and six snake eyes or whatever you're <clears throat> looking for. It will align for a time. And uh, so you do get order out of chaos, but it's temporary. And uh, <clears throat> I, I, that's where we are. We're, we're in a temporary order. And uh, you can literally feel it slipping away. Um, I'm hoping that before it does, we have a shift in consciousness that allows us to alter that trajectory. Because we are... Um, we are God who has broken himself apart into nine billion pieces and we're looking for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we are um, we, we are the divine flame and the sparks that flew from it and the, the Jews of course believe that that is the case and when all the sparks return to the flame then uh, then the game is over. Um, you know, we, we have to keep in mind that one man's myth is another man's religion, mm -hmm. and that within the myth of that other man, there is the same truth that's being proclaimed in what we think of as a religion. We look at the... Uh, the, the construct of, of all of these myths and all of these religions, we're going to find the same thing said the same way with uh, a, a slightly different accent. Uh, and, we, you know, we've got to look out. For example, let me let me just kind of take this a step back. I've got a, a very good friend. He was the doctor of physics that I set under when I was with the um, hypersonic missile technology program. And just as a side note, they're telling you that we don't have the hypersonic missile, uh, mm -hmm. and China does. I, I was on that program for a decade. Obama came in and shut that program down. At the time that we shut it down, we were going Mach 6. Ooh. And if you want to see the program, it's still online. Type in Mach 5, M-A-C-H-5, comma, C-O-L-S-A, COLSA. It'll come up, and you can read about the project that I was on. It's still out there over a decade. It's just been declassified, so you'll get uh, some magazines and different things that look at it. So we had it, and, and one has to ask why it was curtailed 
in order to uh, let China catch up with us. But that's I digress. Mm-hmm. But I digress temporarily. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We'll cover this later. We will. <laughs> Oh, where was I? I lost track of what I was saying. That's for you Uh, folks. One man's myth is another man's religion, and the underlying process is the same. Yeah. And, you know, mythologically, this this is kind of, I think, again, I I go back to Jung. It's what he's pointing to, is that, that, you know, what was the saying? Jesus said about turn over a rock or uh, take an axe to a piece of wood and you'll find me. I I I I am there. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's in the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas. Yeah. Um, Yeah. That was that was I think a very eloquent way of stating something that mainstream Christianity rejects because it moves outside of the, the, the institutional constructs. Again, you know, a lot of the concepts and words, and this is, this is what's so freeing about looking at the work of somebody like Florence Shin, is the concepts and the structures have been so boundaried by doctrines, uh, doctrines of men who have, you know, you and I have talked about this before, about the level of legalism that exists in all of these churches, whether it's Catholicism, whether it is mainstream Protestantism, or even within the evangelical and charismatic and Pentecostal movements. I mean, I saw it. Pentecostals are very legalistic, and in some ways almost superstitious. Yes, yeah. and I, they are. They, I know they t- tried to break away from that. That's one of the things that they tried to do. But the moment that they came up with these uh, uh, these tests, like uh, have you uh, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Well, then you have spoken in tongues. You know that's not what the scriptures say. The the scriptures actually say that when the Spirit came down, there were thousands of people who heard the the apostles preach in their own tongue. So it wasn't that the the apostles were speaking in tongues. The people were hearing in tongues. Mm-hmm. But you can't prove that. See, that's an internal process. And you can't be legalistic unless you can prove something. You have to have evidence for it. So uh, so that was changed and uh, propagated so that they could actually put a stamp on your forehead and go, yep, I heard it. It's true. He's one of us. Mm-hmm. Religion has always been um, exclusive, not inclusive. In some ways, it's even the model of secret societies, whatever, you know, type of mystical orders. I mean, I come from a long line of Freemasons, and I understand a little bit about how the lodges work and what the initiation processes are and the oaths that you take and the things that occur within them. And I'm not criticizing it. I'm not in any way impugning it. I'm simply saying that there's an order to things in order to keep people within the constriction of the particular organization itself, that there is testing that will be done. And that, you know, for the most part, my experience was that most people, most people who sat under that bondage, a lot of times lack self-confidence, which is, you know, the ability to do the inner work, the ability to pray effectively even. I mean, I, I... I ministered to people who had no idea how to pray. And I said, what's in your heart? Find what's in your heart and start there. Because you're supposed to pray with the Holy Spirit. You know, it's interesting, Joseph. Over the time that I, when I I got sick last month, I pulled down my copy of a book called A Course in Miracles. Are you familiar with this? Got it on my bookshelf. And this is, again, another example of a woman who came forward. She said, Helen Stuckman was not a religious person. In fact, at the end of her life, I think she tried to disavow everything. But the fact of the matter is that it was so insistent that with the help of William Thetford, who were, they were professors, uh, medical psychologists at uh, Columbia University in New York, spent, I guess, seven years putting this 1,330-page book together. I mean, it's massive. But 
I've read it before and I've studied it and I've dismissed it sometimes and other times I've looked at it and I thought, well, it's kind of religious in its language, but there's concepts in it that this time when I picked it up, it spoke to me and I started to work with the concepts and look through the language and look through, you know, the fact that well, you can't prove that book was channeled or, you know, there's a million stories out there that will impugn anything that's written like this, but <clears throat> hundreds of thousands of people have, have read that book and taken, gone through those courses. And it, it struck me that the same thing that we're seeing in the Florent Shin material was really resonant a lot with Mary Baker Eddy, obviously, but even in A Course in Miracles, there's this concept that's redefining what was an externalized religion into an inner process, including correcting what we, we call sin, which is not what people think it is. It is an error within ourselves that is separation from Creator. And it's just fascinating yeah. to me because it kind of dovetailed into and gave a lot of meaning to this book that, 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 that you've just put out. So, yes, uh, uh, sin uh, literally means to miss the mark. Uh, it's, it's not that you're going against God. You've simply missed the mark and you've got to correct your aim. And uh, yes, uh, uh, Florence Shin uses an incredible amount of scripture. Uh, but she never tells you where it comes from, and she never puts it in context. Uh, and, and I know the reason for this is that she was re writing this in the 1920s, and let's face it, people were a lot better read in the 1920s than they are today because they didn't have TV. Or, you know, they, they didn't have the distractions. They, they spent time in books. And um, so one of the things that Brendan and I did were, was to go back and put everything in context and uh, explain where the uh, the quote came from and, and what she was trying to get to. Uh, but it is not a religious book. She is using quotes from the scripture uh, as, as a starting point for her story, mm -hmm. which is going to prove a point. And she tells a lot of stories. Uh, you know... Just because an institution has been around for a thousand years or more doesn't mean it's correct. It, it means that it has served a purpose or a balance in a control system. In this case, the schema is society. Mm. Wow. Uh, I, yeah. I think I think of religion like a like the triple triple warmer. If if you're familiar with. Uh, Yes. Uh, acupuncture. I am familiar. I know what a triple warmer is. My wife does energy medicine. Yeah. So, you know, the triple warmer doesn't really exist. It's a place of energy mm -hmm. that, uh, and it, ex but to do without it, the system falls apart. It's imbalanced. I can tell you the difference between having your triple, ba triple burner balanced and unbalanced because I've experienced it. It's incredible. So what happens with an imbalance uh, in that area? Um, for me, it always came about as anxiety. I deal a lot with mm, <clears throat> anxiety. And I will get tense. I will sometimes have intestinal problems. Um, I get very tired to the point where I'm exhausted. And generally, uh, that's kind of flagging signal to me that I need to deal with it. Ah, yeah, yeah. I, I wish I lived closer to your wife and you. Um, I, I need a little bit of balancing myself. I, There's actually out. videos online that show you how to do it. Um, anybody, cool. can, okay. anybody can do a triple warmer. Um, I, the woman's name is Donna Eden. Donna Eden. And my wife got a hold of her videos, and then she bought the book, and she started practicing Donna Eden's. Donna Eden's interesting. She's very animated. Um, she's an older lady, uh, but she has a lot of energy, and she intuited the system. Again, another healer, another female. <clears throat> She intuitively understood and began to find the energy lines in the body. 
And her method is completely her own. Nobody taught her. She's refined it over the years, and she's worked with other people. But the basic techniques are, are basically uh, s as simple as thumping certain key points and especially activation of the lymphatic glands. So uh, people okay. can look into that. Donna Eden. That's very good information, especially where I am in life, which is, you know, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting older. Type and, it into, uh, type it into YouTube. You can pull up some videos. Definitely will. Absolutely. So um, religion, religion wants to evolve. Men want to evolve spiritually. But let me, let me put this a different way. Men want to evolve spiritually, but the religious person wants to keep things the same because religion forms a bulwark where you do not have to make decisions on your own. You're guided by a set of rules, which are external rules. And anybody that, uh, uh, that comes against those rules and says, hey, you should think outside of this system and delve deeper and look at what it's trying to teach you, they, they usually get, uh, get crucified. Um, yeah, or yeah. stoned, uh, or um, yeah, impaled, uh, burned at the stake. Yep, or stabbed in the neck. Yeah. Uh, remember, several days ago, Salman Rushdie, Salman Rushdie was stabbed yeah. in the neck. So, <clears throat> a lot of people don't understand what went on there. Um, you know, doing what I do, I have to keep up with this. And, and so, let me just tell your your audience real, really quickly, what actually went on in. Um, Around 1987, I believe it was, yep. uh, Salman Rushdie wrote a book called The Satanic Verses. The Satanic Verses are actually part of the Quran. It's uh, uh, 53, 19 through 20. And what happened, and I, I, I really want your audience to kind of soak this in because it's just crazy important and it's just so weird. So um, he's, he's in a city, uh, Muhammad is in a city that is very prosperous and very stable. And uh, they, they worship these uh, city gods, there's three of them. And, uh, and he comes in and he goes, hey guys, you got this all wrong, uh, all wrong. You, you got to get rid of these gods. As a matter of fact, Allah is one and there's only one true God and um, you got to get rid of these gods. And they went, no. Let's just stone you because this city is stable and you're trying to make it unstable. It's prosperous and we don't want to risk it. So then he, being an opportunist, then he says, oh, wait, I've had a vision. And, uh, and he names these three gods of uh, Alot and al Uza and uh, Manat. And he says, there's these three goddesses and the other one. These are exalted intermediaries whose intersection, intercession should be hoped for or prayed for. So he's, he basically says, you know, your three gods, they're, they're kind of intermediaries to Allah. They're like angels. You can pray to them. It's going to be okay. And then he goes away for a while, and, and they let him live. And after he gets tactical advantage and his numbers grow, he then comes back and he says, the devil made me do it. Satan uh, fooled me. And this particular utterance in the Quran is actually Satan fooling me. And that's why they're called the satanic verses. Well, Salman Rushdie latches onto this when he writes his fictitious novel. It is it's not this fiction novel. Um, and he says, basically, if Satan can fool the prophet, then anything and everything is up for grabs. And Islam itself may be controlled by Satan. This pisses the uh, Ayatollah at the time off. Khomeini. Yes. Yeah. And a fatwa, uh, Rahula Khomeini issues of fatwa in 1989, mm -hmm. 1989. Yeah. And he says, <clears throat> kill Rushdie, kill his editors, kill his uh, publishers. So it's taken, <clears throat> and then Rushdie goes into hiding. It's taken from 1989 to 2022, 
before anybody could get close enough to try to kill him. And that's what's going on out there. So you cannot convince me in any way, shape, or form that Islam is a, uh, uh, is a religion of peace or, or, or even uh, that it, it's, uh, it's tolerant. It is intolerant. It is the height of what was happening before the Axial Age. It is external and it is driven uh, by uh, this kind of activity um, and not internal uh, seeking. There is a piece of Islam called the Sufis mm-hmm. that, that have tried to rise above this. And every, every time you, you turn around, there's an argument with the fundamental Islamists, the fundamental Muslims, that Sufi is or is not, uh, Sufism is or is not part of Islam. They, they really can't decide. They don't know what to do with them because they go against the grain of this uh, uh, fundamentalism. So there's my rant about that. That's what's going on out there in the world this week. I think it's rather interesting that this whole thing with Salman Rushdie being attacked crops up at this particular time, too. You know, call it synchronicity or an opportunistic window. But given the events, of, you know, are just... You know, it's not even unfolding anymore. It's like they're shot out of a cannon into our faces via the media. Um, yes. This was actually a very interesting, because many many people don't remember that. I mean, if, uh, some part of my audience, I'm pretty sure, wouldn't remember this. They either weren't born yet or they were small children, and for no good reason would they have ever needed to know this. But it harkens back to really uh, this period of... You know, deep strife that we were immersed into, you know, that period in 90, the 90s, you know, we're, we're deep in the gun barrel of this thing. We've gone through the first Iraq war, which was, you know, preceded by the famous Arab oil embargoes and um, the intrigues that went on around um, the ineptitude of the Jimmy Carter administration over captives in, in Iran. And it feels in a lot of ways like the way I've described the eye of the needle process, which is you're twirling through a tube, which is mirrored. And at times things are reflecting back through that tube as almost kind of like a, I guess, a deja vu or a video replay of something in some form of distortion or inversion. And (laughs) it's like this weird time stream we're in. Well... Uh, things uh, things repeat within the time stream, uh, but not quite the same. They, exactly. Uh, so the last time this happened, um, uh, this, this kind of spiritual upheaval at the same time that there was uh, war going on was the Vietnam War. Mm-hmm. And uh, at that particular time, what did we have? We had the Jesus Freak movement. Exactly, yeah. Uh, and we had this really odd thing that came out called Good News for Modern Man, which was a, uh, a modernized uh, King James New Testament, or I should say a modernized New Testament. It was actually well. taken out of the Greek. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and, and that actually formed the basis. This is how old I am, guys. That actually formed the basis of why Fifth Estate came about. The idea because I lived through all of this, and the idea that uh, you could take a Bible that was rel- relatively difficult to understand, uh, you know, we don't really have the 1611 version of the King James. You can't really read that. I've got a copy of it. We've got the 1700 version of mm-hmm. it, and, uh, you know, that's where the language began to change into an Elizabethan type of English, and uh, we were able to, to kind of get a grasp on it, but... Uh, You know, for example, when it says, uh, put your ear to the ground, it doesn't mean your ear. It's talking about the ear of a plow, but we've lost all of this. So what they did was they they modernized the language into this little book called Good News for Modern Man, and it allowed the uh, the masses to to once again uh, comprehend and apprehend what was actually going on in the scriptures. And the Jesus movement at the time... uh, you know, the Jesus freaks uh, took this and they ran with it. And 
an explosion happened uh, in in uh, California. Uh, so that gave that gave me the idea of what fifth estate should be. So we began to take all of these ancient and hard to understand uh, uh, books, like the Book of Enoch, the last time it was really uh, modernized, uh, was was in the uh, early 1900s. The, the language has changed so much, and uh, back in that day, they used to write in a what I would call a quasi Elizabethan uh, type of uh, language to mm-hmm. give more gravitas to their work. You Very know. formal, yeah. Yes, and, and it made it uh, very difficult to understand. So we began to take these things and break them down, put them in modern English and put them out so that the new audience uh, could, could uh, easily understand, put footnotes within the text because nobody likes to take their mind or their, their, their eyes off of the text and look at a footnote. So we took it and put it inside the text so that it would read better. And, uh, and I'm sure that in 50 years, some jerk will do the same thing that I did. <laughs> You've done a service. I will point out to my listeners, because this is subject matter that we've covered um, in the Receivers series of The Eye of the Needle, the, the, Joseph's publication, The Books of Enoch, The Angels, The Watchers, and The Nephilim. This was, interestingly enough, the title that you and I came to know each other over because I found you as a result of looking at this book, and we had a conversation that we never really concluded that went into, you know, some of these aspects of the Nephilim and the mingling that occurred. Um, It was a very impactful event on history, and it keeps revisiting us because there's ripples of that that are coming through even in the modern time. And so to my listeners, you know, and this would be one of the books that if I haven't done so already, I'd point to and say this is uh, a, a translation of the books of Enoch that is not only accessible language-wise, but has the commentary and the notes and the flow to it for a modern reader. That book has been, and, and I tell people, I, I feel like I was there and it happened. I really didn't do it, but I was there and it happened. And that book has been in the number one category of some little category on Amazon uh, pretty much nonstop for, um, for 10 years. It certainly deserves to be there. And a lot of these other Book of Giants, Watchers, Nephilim, and the Book of Enoch as well, you know, these are companion books. Everybody should own a Lost Books of the Bible. So I, I've... I probably have three copies of this one that's so ratted and dog-eared because I've had it since I was probably 16 years old because I was told these were forbidden books and I went, it was like the Playboy rack in the back of the bookstore. I'm like, <laughs> um, gosh, if it's forbidden, I really probably should read this because that's just how in the hell I roll. And so I wound up with this dog-eared copy of the forbidden books of the Bible which I came to find out, you know, whether you call them pseudepigraphical or whatever term the, uh, the, the theologists are using, pretty freaking interesting and just as historically import, important as well. It, it does give you some pause to think. Uh, and I, I challenge your audience to, uh, to read uh, not only the Bible, but these lost books with a critical eye and, uh, and, and really watch the wording um, there, there's, you know, in the Bible, you, you literally trip over these things and you go, what? Like, um, yeah. like yeah. Habakkuk. Uh, Habakkuk 3 says God came out of Teman. How can God come out of anything? Uh, especially a little <laughs> town of, or area of Teman. But it, it turns out that, um, and I'm going to digress again, you know, how my mind works. Go for um, it. Well, it it turns out that um, that area uh, was full of copper mines, and uh, and the Egyptians had worked those copper mines until, well, their slaves did, until they gave up and went away. Mm -hmm. And then these tribes came in, and uh, and they set up, and they had uh, their own people working it, so, you know, they had skin in the game, so the copper mines there got so 
big that they they uh, were were bigger than even uh, when the Egyptians had the land, and uh, and the name Yahweh uh, appears in that area at that time, almost like Yahweh was I don't know like uh, like Vulcan, you know? Kind of was, yeah, yeah. And uh, so you have the Canaanite god El. And uh, and you have the, the the Hebrews being exposed to this uh, Yahweh, right? And uh, they they take Yahweh, who has at that particular point he's evolved to be a whole lot like Baal, kind of a storm god. As a matter of fact, the Yahweh is supposed to come from a cognate that means blowing wind, and um, and they basically take Yahweh and they put him in the Canaanite structure of the uh, El Ashra. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, man, woman, and the seventy kids, and Yahweh um, is said to have taken uh, Judah or Israel as his inheritance from El, and so then you have this uh, this handoff, this really weird handoff that happens in um, in um, Exodus. Um, let me just read this real quick. And no, no, we'll this is good something. stuff. You guys are, so you you guys are getting Who is El and, and who is Yahweh? And how well, did this they is come something I've struggled with. And, I, you know, I've, I've struggled with this. I mean, Yahweh really looks like a demiurge to me in a lot of ways. Uh, well, Marcion thought he was. Mm-hmm. Marcion actually calls him that. But I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, this this is um, Exodus 6. I'm going to begin at 2. He says, um, uh, I, God, spake to Moses and said unto him, I am Yahweh. Now, I'm reading out of something called the Word, which is 26 translations. So, just, you know, bear with me here. I am Yahweh. And I appeared to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob who revealed uh, myself to, and I revealed myself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, but did not make myself known to them by my name Yahweh. I made my compact with them to give them land in Canaan and uh, of their pilgrimage and wherein they were uh, strangers. And I truly uh, um, opened my ears to their cries and uh, whom the Egyptians had enslaved, and I will remember my covenant and exercise it. Uh, You, therefore, quote me to the Israelites, saying, I am Yahweh, and uh, I will take you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, make you safe from their power. I will deliver you uh, from them by my main force, uh, and the stroke of my power, I will adopt you as my own people. I will become your God, uh, and I am Yahweh, and I am your God who brought you out. So, at that point in uh, Exodus six, we have a handoff, a literal, literal handoff. Gosh, between I've read that, and I never read it like that before. It's fascinating. Yeah, get get back to what. Uh, r- grab yourself a Hebrew um, interlinear, mm-hmm. and uh, or <laughs> get this uh, this Word Bible, which is twenty six translations. It'll lay it out for you, and you can go, oh, that's where it happened. So um, somewhere around um, one thousand two hundred BC. We have the storm god El and the god of wind Yahweh uh, being intermingled. Yahweh had always uh, been kind of like Baal, which Baal just means Lord. And uh, the Hebrews were trying to get rid of the Canaanite gods and establish a monotheistic society. Before then, they were something called uh, hedonistic or hedotheist, which is uh, hedotheist is, I believe there's a superior God and then there are inferior gods. They're kind of a pantheon. 
Yeah, it, it's um, a pantheon with a supreme god at the head. We still have that today. Yeah, don't of course we, we do. Yeah. We, we have God, and then we have Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, Azazel, all of these things that, that spun off of it. Um, well, that's effectively know, what happened in Zoroastrianism as well. You, you, you had the emergence of other what we would call, I guess, lesser gods, angelic hosts, some of which were not good, by the way. And you, you see the same thing. The thing that happened that was most dangerous in my mind was the collapse of all those identities in the English Bibles get collapsed into this concept of God as one God, monotheism, this is all one God. And when you read the Old Testament, as you've pointed out, with the ability to parse it out better, you come to understand that they were not monotheistic. These were not the same character. And I think Jesus addresses this as well when he tells the Sanhedrin that they are of their father, the devil. I think yeah. that's what was pointing to. He was disavowing the affiliation with those previous gods. Yes. Um, you, you, you find it beginning in um, Psalms 82, where it says, uh, quite literally, um, Yahweh stood in the council of El. And um, so it was, it was El's pantheon, and Yahweh was addressing them. And uh, so it says God stood in the pantheon, or the, the uh, assembly of the gods, uh, and what you really find is that um, there is uh, El El is over the pantheon but he's really not there it's his pantheon but he's, he seems to be absent at the time and uh, Yahweh has stood up and, and challenged the other gods who were over the other countries, the other nations and he's saying you guys suck and um, <laughs> you uh he, he, he literally does. He says, you know, something uh, you're you're allowing your people uh, to do bad things and you are you're helping them do bad things and you're bad gods. And um, you're, you're going to end up getting killed just like uh, a normal human. And you have to wonder if this is not um, the, uh, the the angels of watchers that he's actually addressing. Uh, there's 200 of those guys, mm -hmm. but uh, they they had just a few leaders, uh, you know, 10 or 20 leaders. So you kind of wonder if that's not the leaders that he's addressing. And uh, so anyway, I'll just leave this that This actually there. gets addressed as well in a number of surveys under the heading of the Anunnaki, which is, you know, this is very fringe material, but there's actually some very good work out there that indicates that what we're looking at there is almost like kind of an alien race. I mean, I don't know how else to term it. It looks as though they were very advanced and they were practicing genetic engineering back uh, five, six thousand years ago, modestly according to the chronology of the, the, the text. And they appear to have been building civilizations and uh, doing high-end mining and, and construction operations. There's, there's something that lurks in the background of all of this that's sort of ominous, and I think in a lot of ways it foreshadows even where we are right now. I mean, look at the it, world it we does. live in. and You know, tell me yeah. these heads of states are much different than the warlords that these people labored under. Well, we, we just had a virus that was released probably uh, by mistake, but still engineered and released. And uh, it took out, you know, uh, many, many, many thousands of people around the world. And uh, and it was nothing more than genetic engineering. You, you find this in uh, in the book of uh, Jubilees. Mm -hmm. uh, Jubilees and Jasher, both, uh, they uh, I think it's Jasher that says that they ruled over us as our governors because they were superior. Uh, Jubilees actually says um, that they were teaching the mixing of animals, that they actually had gotten to a point that they were mixing species. Well, I mean, mm -hmm. think of the uh, think of think of the uh, Greco-Roman ideas of harpies and minotaurs mm -hmm. and centaurs and things like that. So what was going on? Probably L is running 
a DNA uh, uh, test. He, he is actually, uh, you know, we he, he's dropped the DNA in. Mankind is beginning to evolve. We come into a uh, sentience. Uh, we become Homo sapiens. Um, yeah, they were basically running these... some sort of CRISPR program. Yes, and so this is Joseph's theory on everything. My <laughs> wife tells me I've got a theory about everything, so I just I'll put this out here. What if this CRISPR program that was being run by L is in time aiming toward the highest evolutionary point of mankind? And what if these watchers are looking at all of this and decide they do not want this to happen because they do not want their authority usurped and they don't want a being higher in some way, shape, or form than them to be realized? So they come down and they screw up the project. They start swapping out DNA. They start making animals and humans that never should have been made. Giants, Nephthalim, Elio. What the hell is an Elio? The, the only thing we can come up with is that is, is, is a cognate of Elion, and it means godling. So uh, these these Elios that are mentioned mm. in uh, scriptures. Yeah, it's, it's a Hebrew uh, are term, El- Elion, by the way, it's, it's referenced. Yeah. Yes. So, so you've got... Uh, You've got these demigods that show up. Well, he wipes out everything. He begins again with um, only one family that hasn't been contaminated. And, and, of course, that would be Noah. And so it begins again. And where does it end? Well, it ends with, uh, with Jesus and Lao Tzu and Buddha and the axial age being recognized. The question is, are we in for another jump? And can we survive until we reach that other pinnacle? We'll leave this show on that cliffhanger. Um, <laughs> it's an interesting place to put it. Joseph, you were expansive, you were generous with your time for this audience, and. Um, embedded in all of this is very interesting things that we will talk more about in future casts such as this. Again, com is the website. There will be links. Well, there will be links for the books for where to find the book on Florence Shin and the, her greatest works, The Law of Attraction, Manifesting Will and Your Divine Right, written by Joseph and his son, Brandon, who have had the opportunity to talk to and Fifth Estate Publishing will obviously continue to move forward into the future, which is, you know, it's great to know because we're all getting tired out here. Um, (laughs) Hand off the baton. That's been great. Thank you so much for coming on. We will extend this conversation into the Fly on the Wall segment for our subscribers at Patreon. If you'd like to do that, it is patreon.com forward slash Randy Moggins and the website don't forget the website. There's stuff there that's not anywhere else. And that is offplanetradio.com. We will um, catch some of you on the other side. And to the rest of you, the truth is out there. It's inside you. Now go find it. Peace. Out. Planet Radio.